We're continuing to look at the interaction of continuous functions with the topology of the real line. And in this video, we're going to look at connected sets. Let's go ahead and recall what a connected set is. So a set A of the real numbers is said to be disconnected if there exists E and F, also subsets of real numbers, such that A is the union of E and F, and in fact it's the disjoint union of E and F plus some extra stuff. And that extra stuff is that E intersected with the closure of F is empty, and the closure of E intersected with F is also empty. So in other words, E contains no limit points of F and vice versa. In other words, F contains no limit points of E. Just recall that the closure of a set is the set union its limit points. And then next we say that A is connected if it is not disconnected. And I also want to recall the intermediate value theorem from a calculus one type class. And that's because the big theorem that we're going to prove in this video will imply as a corollary this intermediate value theorem. So the intermediate value theorem says that if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, that closed interval we'll call it A to B, and the value of the function at the endpoints is not the same, in other words, f of a is not equal to f of b, then for every y naught between f of a and f of b, there is an x naught on the open interval a to b such that f of x naught equals y naught. So notice what we've got going on here is y naught is like our value which is intermediate to the value on the endpoints. And this says that we are able to achieve that intermediate value somewhere on the open interval. Okay, great. Now we're gonna prove this following theorem and we'll show how that implies this as a corollary at the end. So the theorem that we wanna prove says that if we have a continuous function on A, and so this is continuous at every point in A and A is a subset of the real numbers, and then we have a subset of A, which we'll call B, and that's a connected subset, then F of B is also connected. So in other words, the image of a connected set is connected. Okay, and so we want to prove that using this definition of uh, connected sets. So let's suppose that we've got something that looks like a disconnection of F of B and show that in fact it isn't one. So limit points from one set will be in the other set or vice versa. So what we're gonna do is suppose that we can take F of B and rewrite it as E union F with E intersect F equals the empty set. So notice you can do this for any set of real numbers, just like pick a point in the set and take everything above that point and everything less than or equal to that point. That's most definitely gonna be this kind of setup. You can always write a set of real numbers as a disjoint union. But you may not be able to do it in a way that the closures don't overlap like this. So let's go ahead and point out what we want to show. So we want to show that f of b is connected. In other words, we want to show that e closure intersect f is non-empty or e intersect f closure is non-empty. In other words, we don't have a disconnection and so that means we have a connected set. Okay, so let's get to it. So we want to get back to the set B because we know something about that set B. We know that that set is connected. So let's do that using inverse images. So let's set C equal to the inverse image of E, but we don't want the entire inverse image of B. We want the inverse image of B which is inside of E which is inside of B. So we'll just intersect that with B. And that's because E may contain some stuff that also comes from outside of B, just if F is not a one-to-one -one function or something. And then similarly, we're gonna set D equal to the inverse image of F intersected with B. Now what we wanna claim is that B is equal to C union D. So let's see how we can do that. So let's suppose that X is in B, 
Now we wanna show that X is either in C or D. But now notice the fact that X is in B, that tells us that F of X is inside of F of B, the image of B. But we know the image of B is equal to E union F. But by the definition of union, that means that F of X is in E or F of X is in F. But that means that X is in F inverse E, the pre-image of E, or X is in F inverse of F, the pre-image of F. But the fact that we have it's already in B, and then it's either here or here, that tells us that it's in C or D because we have it's in B and it's in F inverse of E, but that and statement gives us an intersection or it's in B and it's in the inverse image of F. But again, that and statement gives us an intersection, which is this uh, set D here. So here we have X is in C or X is in D, but that tells us that X is in C union D. So we finished the proof of this claim. Great. And so now let's go ahead and maybe clean up the proof of this claim and then we'll move on to the next step. So we just constructed two sets C and D related to our function F whose union is B, which we have assumed to be a connected set. So the fact that B is connected, that tells us that C intersected with D bar, in other words, the closure of D is non-empty, or C bar intersected with D, in other words, the closure of C intersected with D is non-empty. So let's maybe write that down. So either C bar intersect D is non-empty, or C intersect D bar is non-empty. So without loss of generality, let's maybe assume that C bar intersect D is non-empty. It's gonna be exactly the same if we have the other case, so it's safe to do this. So notice what that means is that D contains a limit point of C. Remember, C bar is equal to C and then all of its limit points. But notice that that tells us there exists some sequence, we'll call it Xn, n goes from one to infinity, totally contained in C, such that the limit as n goes to infinity of X sub n equals X is inside of D. And then notice, since this is a limit of a sequence of guys that are inside of C, that also tells us that X is inside of C bar. So we proved that a long time ago, that if you have a limit point of a set, then you can construct a sequence that converges to that limit point. Okay, great. And then now we haven't used the fact that F is continuous, so we better do that. So since F is continuous, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x sub n equals f of x. So this is the sequential version of continuity. But now what I wanna notice is that this sequence defined by the function and our original sequence, so in other words, the sequence of numbers f of x sub n, that's going to be inside of E because it was inside of the original C. And notice that puts it inside of E after evaluating it at the function. But now, since this is a sequence of numbers in E, that tells us that the limit of this sequence of numbers is in the closure of E. We'll call that E bar. And then also, since X is in D, from our earlier argument, we have F evaluated at X is inside of F because of our construction of D up here. So let's see what we have. We have F of X is in E bar and F of X is in F, which tells us that F of X is inside of E closure intersected with F, which must be a non-empty set if it has an element. 
so we tried for a disconnection of our image of B f of B and we ended up finding that such a disconnection was impossible. So in other words, the image of a connected set is connected. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this proof and then we'll look at how this implies the intermediate value theorem. Now we're ready to use this general theorem in order to prove the intermediate value theorem. So let's recall that the intermediate value theorem says that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval a, b, and f of a is not equal to f of b, then for every y naught between f of a and f of b, there is an x naught on the open interval a, b, such that f of x naught equals y naught. Okay, so let's get to the proof. So let's first notice that this closed interval a, b is connected and it's compact. So recall that compact in the real numbers means closed and bounded. So that's most definitely closed because it's a closed interval and it's bounded because it is of finite length. So notice that that tells us that the image, we'll call that F of AB like this, is also connected and compact. So also connected and compact. So it's connected because of this previous theorem that we just got done proving, and it's compact from a theorem in a previous video which says that the image of a compact set is compact. Now if we've got a connected and a compact set of real numbers, or I should say a set of real numbers that is both connected and compact, that implies that it's a closed interval. So that tells us that f of a, b equals C, D for some C and D and R. So again, it's a closed interval. Another thing that we want to notice is that we also know that F of A is an element of C, D, and F of B is also an element of C, D. So why is that? Well, that's because f of a is most definitely in the image of f of the interval a, b, and similarly for f of b. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is assume that f of a is less than f of b. So it may seem like we're losing something here, but we're really not, and we can do that by replacing f with the function negative f as needed. So notice f and negative f are essentially the same function, except what happens is you're gonna change the ordering here. Good, and then the next thing that we wanna notice is that the open interval f of a to f of b is totally contained in this closed interval c to d. Great, and now next, we wanna take a y naught in the open interval f of a to f of b, which like I said is a subset of this closed interval C to D which is equal to the image of F of AB and notice the fact that it's in the image of F of AB that tells us that there exists an X naught in the closed interval AB such that F of X naught equals Y naught. So that's the definition of being in the image of that set um, AB. Great. And then also, we want to notice that x naught is not equal to a or b because we have y naught is not equal to f of a or f of b. So let's say y naught is not equal to f of a or f of b by our construction via this open interval right here. And that's exactly what we needed to finish in order to prove this intermediate value theorem from our more general theorem. And that's a good place to stop.